Hi, this is Eric Durack, and welcome to this edition of TV Santa Barbara and TV Santa Barbara Forum, uh, where we talk about business issues and we talk about things that are pertinent for today. I am today's guest host, and our guest today comes all the way from Los Angeles area, and I'd like to introduce the, the audience to Deborah Babar, who is a retired book publishing executive uh, who worked uh, in the East Coast uh, for a while, and she's now involved in community organizing for the health and medical freedom groups throughout the South Coast. Um, a, a key focus of Deborah's is what's called the Private Membership Association, or the PMA. It really is the cornerstone of what we're gonna be talking about today. So we wanna, we wanna dive into what is a PMA, how it works, and how people can actually join. So Deborah, welcome to the show today. Thank you very thank, much, thank, thank you for coming all, well, you came up from Thousand Oaks, right? Actually, not Thousand Oaks, not quite so far, but Port Wainimi, well, surrounding. Still. Uh, nearby community. Nearby interest. community, but not, not Upper State Street, like Correct. some people do. Yeah, so it, it takes a little bit of time, but I really appreciate you coming up uh, to the studio. Um, so we, when I was here, when I was guest hosting two weeks ago for the forum on TV Santa Barbara, I had a young man uh, in your chair named Justin Shores who was the, one of the board members of Stand Up Santa Barbara. So we were talking mm -hmm. about medical freedom issues and where that organization is and how they're moving forward in this community. You're looking at things in a little bit different perspective. Um, in terms, of, in terms of having some sort of a national change. And part of this is developing what this, this concept of a private membership association. And what a lot of people are gonna think about is, uh, well, that's a country club. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, Barack Obama's part of a, you know, or, or you know, Jack Benny or Bob Hope, those guys were all in these private, or, private country clubs. We have some private country clubs here in, in Montecito. Mm -hmm. um, the Valley Club is a private, I don't know if it's a PMA, but it's a private club. You have to pay a dues, you have to whatever, whatever. So how did, how did PMAs get started? G give me sort of this historical context on where these, where these organizations came from. So actually PMAs preceded any of the more commercial things that we know of today, like the retail store, the outlets you're gonna see on the streets, mm -hmm. um, the dry cleaners that you have, because What's key here is the word private. So right. private membership associations operate in the private domain of commerce, not in the public domain of commerce. So your notation or your note about um, the elite, um, it's true. The elite of the elite use private membership associations and private commercial um, contracts right. to keep their business away from prying eyes. Like private jet corporations. A uh, hundred percent. That's, that's, that's the, probably one of the best things. It's a private jet. That's why they call it a private jet. Yes. So. The distinction here is, um, and perhaps the best way to start this conversation, because it took me about a year and a half to kind of wrap my head around what this is. Um, private contracts amongst people or between people have been going on since we started walking the face of the earth. So this is, the concept is as old as mankind. Right. In the context of our country, we have our Declaration of Independence and we have our 17, Constitution. 1770s, the Constitution 1781 or whatever. 1787, 1787. and the Bill of Rights. Right. But what's important about these, those are our founding documents <laughs> that frame everything else that we are operating in today in right. terms of our public, um, inter, our public engagements. What a PMA is, it's a business entity, just like an LLC only it's in the private domain, not in the public domain. So the documents for the PMA are key, the founding documents. Okay. So our Declaration of Independence is to our country, what the Articles of Association are to a PMA. Our Constitution and Bill of Rights are to our nation, what the bylaws are to a PMA. Okay. What's important about this is that in our country, it, just, it details, these doc, our founding documents detail that the structure of our government from the federal to state to local county municipalities, all forms of government in the United States, legislatures make the laws. There are no enforcement mechanisms within those laws. The enforcement is charged to or the responsibility of the executive branches of governments. 
as a result, all of that is constituted by our founding documents mm -hmm. to manage um, the conflict amongst the public populations that may have cultural differences or differences of opinion, but it's about managing the public interactions of right. individuals. So you can become an LLC, in which case you ask for a number or permission from the state to, to operate as such. Or you, you pay a fee, like and you would you with an S fee. Corp or a C Corp or anything else. And what you do with that, that's like a mini contract. When you do that, there are decades, in some cases, millennia long um, precedents of you behaving a certain way because you ask permission from the state to sell widgets. And this right. is how you're going to sell widgets. Right. So within that is the um, uh, rules, regulations, and agencies, the executive branches of government, in this case a state government, has instituted to ensure that the laws are enforced. But they're enforced on the public through those rules, regulations, and agencies, right. like an FDA, like a health department, like the CDC, like OSHA. Right, but, but I have to remind you that the CDC is not a government agency. Exa that's exactly what I'm saying, is right. that, uh, and I'm sorry if it was a little confusing. So what we're talking about here is the executive branches of government are supposed to create rules, regulations, and agencies. In this case, the executive branch of government right. created the CDC. They created the FDA. They created the EPA. Right. They created the the OSHA, et cetera, right? et cetera, et cetera. Right. Exactly. Right. So uh -huh. those that we, we <clears throat> often think of them as quasi governmental because they're not um, they're not government in that they're not part of um, the elected body, which right. is what our government is. But they're part of the tools the executive branch uses to to enforce the laws on our land. Right. Now, when you take and you move your entire bit of commerce into the private realm, into a PMA, and you deal only with your private membership, it is like an extension of your home. It is like an extension of your dining room table. You have an Uncle Jack who is a doctor, an MD, and comes over for dinner and you say, Uncle Jack, little Mary has a sore throat. Could you take a look at her sore throat? And Uncle Jack says, sure, I'll take a look at her sore throat. And Uncle Jack says, oh, this looks like the XYZ that I've been seeing come into the office the last two weeks. Right. Um, I'll tell you what, um, get little Mary, you guys come to my office on Monday and let me give you a prescription. So what that MD has done in the privacy of the home has diagnosed that child with a particular um, something. something. Yeah. And now what that MD has done in the privacy of the home has said, I'm going to suggest to you that you come to my office where, with you wearing my public hat, my licensed MD public hat, I will give you a prescription. Right. Because in the state of California, you have to be a licensed MD to give prescriptions. Right. And here's, here's kind of where you know, I've got a series of questions, sure. but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop, skip, and jump during this conversation. So let's talk about that medical license. Mm -hmm. That doctor, that student goes to medical school, and then they do a residency program, and then they, they sit for the state board. So the state of California decrees that they have a license. And now what we're seeing across the entire United States is that doctors are being told things about COVID, things about COVID mRNA gene therapies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which most people think of as vaccines. And um, one of the things that I found very interesting is, is and I'm gonna, gonna pull this up now, um, this is an article from the Ventura County um, uh, Conejo Guardian mm -hmm. newspaper. And this was online, and what's happening in Ventura County, which is just north of Los Angeles, is that nurses are being told, nurses and doctors, if you don't get your, your I'll call it vaccine, but your, your messenger RNA mm -hmm. shot or your other J&J &J mm -hmm. shot or whatever, uh, we're gonna, you're, we're gonna be, terminate your, your contract, which I believe is in violation of the law. I also believe it's in violation of HIPAA laws. I also believe it's in violation of California right to work laws. And it certainly is in violation of the contract that the nurses union has with the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it's in violation of a lot of things, but we're seeing the courts rule in favor of these, these, these organizations. So these licensed practitioners are now choosing 
to not be involved with this public hospital system, which is what you just spoke about. And I want to just read, uh, you know, just a couple mm -hmm. things here is that the doctors are not reporting to the VAERS system, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. No doctor will admit that it's vaccines that are causing problems now in patients. Uh, they won't make a VAERS report. So they're no longer testing people for COVID, rather they begin testing those people who are symptomatic with shortness of breath, for example, and those who are unvaccinated. So why aren't they concerned about natural immunity? One of the, one of the um, uh, uh, nurses says, you know, the quality of healthcare, she says, in California is rapidly declining. The, the site, they cite serious mistakes in surgeries, chronic understaffing, the loss of veteran nurses due to the mandates. And she says this onslaught of what I call newbies, she calls them the new girls who are green at the gills. She says they're part of now this whole issue. They don't understand the differential diagnosis. They cannot help the doctors, you know, things, things are not going well. But on the last page of this article, Susan writes, this nurse writes, they also speak among themselves of building private membership association hospitals where unvaccinated people can go to work. Quote, people are getting smart. They're going to create their own separate parallel system, Jennifer says. Holy cow, Deborah, look what you got yourself into. That's an amazing article. This is a really well-written article by um, uh, uh, Joel Kilpatrick, and I actually wrote to, to, to The Guardian yesterday when I, when I printed this out, and I said, this is a really, really strong article because mm -hmm. you don't hear the side of the, and there's a lot more to it about the problems in this hospital system, the problems with their constitutional rights. Uh, there's six, I think there's six nurses that they quote in here. Uh, two of them don't give their names, but they, they give a little piece on all of them, and they're all talking about the, 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 the quality of care. But I found it very interesting that they're now looking at PMAs for hospital services. I find that fascinating. So my next question is, is that you know, you've come on board with PMAs because you don't like what's going on uh, with, with, with the, the, the things that the state government's doing with uh, Joe Biden mandates for, for all of these people. And you know, he's trying to just basically say, everyone who's got over 100 employees, well, you all have to, no, you don't. So give me an example of how this overreach is, is, I mean, we all know what is being affected, people anywhere, uh, but how, how can a PMA help m mitigate this, this the situation mm -hmm. we find ourselves in right now? So the key here to understand is what is jurisdiction? So oh, yes. in jurisdiction is everything. And by the way, the, um, one of the key founders of the Conejo Guardian um, is a friend of mine for years. And mm -hmm. so we've been having this conversation about PMAs for a while. So I'm not surprised, uh, of course, that it appears in the, in the paper. Um, and so what we have here is in the public realm, there are public laws, and that's what they're called, which are again used to manage um, the relationships and the interactions of the public with itself. Okay. We move it into the private realm, like in a private hospital. The private hospital as a PMA um, serves only its private members. It does not serve the public, and therefore it is not under the jurisdiction of the public rules, regulations, and agencies. It is not under the jurisdiction of the CDC. It is not under the jurisdiction of the health department. It is not under any of those jurisdictions because those are constituted to manage the relationships amongst the public, from one public to the next. The PMA, when dealing only with its private members, its jurisdiction or its governance is through its founding documents. Mm -hmm. And those founding documents well-founded documents would detail how um, uh, issues or conflicts are resolved within the PMA. An example of this that I think might resonate with the audience would be this. Let's take a restaurant, because this applies to any industry, the private membership association concept, any okay. industry at all. Um, a restaurateur. A restaurateur, let's say he has a restaurant that seats 30 people and he has a license to uh, serve alcohol, he has a license to open a restaurant from the state, mm -hmm. and now he serves 30 people. The health department comes and says, I'm here to inspect and see that your refrigerator is at 33 degrees. The health department has a right, has an authority to come in because it's a public accommodation. Right. They asked for permission to open a restaurant from the state. They asked for permission to sell alcohol from the ABC right. uh, board. And so now they come in So and they have they to check. abide by the rules now, that they actually agreed that, to at the beginning. Exactly, they exactly, their, because right. it's about contractual, it's a contractual and jurisdiction. Right. Exactly. That same Got restaurant it. tour has a home 
and invites 60 people, twice as many people as his restaurant holds, to come to his private dinner at his private home. He now serves them, all 60 of them, twice as many as in his restaurant. The health authorities have no jurisdiction whatsoever mm -hmm. to come into his house and say, I'm here to check the temperature of your refrigerator. Right. That is a really excellent illustration of the public domain versus the mm -hmm. private domain. Can I ask a, a sort of sure. a hypothetical about that same restaurateur? Mm -hmm. Let's say that he wants to become a PMA, but people from the public come to his restaurant, how would that work if, he, if, if, he's, a, if he's a private membership, like, like a country club, and that's, well, let's kind of go back to the elites here. Country clubs have restaurants. Restaurants in some instances may have to have county health department things in terms of meat, you know, spoilage or whatever. Some, some you know, weddings is, is another example, a private wedding. And I know a lot of people who get sick at, you know, not a lot, but there are people who get sick at weddings because the, the, you know, the ice is bad or the, the shrimp has not been served properly or whatever. But those are sort of, sort of uh, an incidence or, or, or description of a private organization, a private wedding. But if this restaurateur wants to be a PMA, but still be open to the public, is there a conflict of interest there? So yes, there is. Okay. There is a conflict of interest, and that's where the protection for your um, PMA members and you as the owner of the PMA is that you serve only your private members. Like the country club so, restaurant. So for instance, the individual who has a private home and serves 60 people, right. private guests, but also then rents their home to any public entity that wants to come and use it for an event, they then are um, kind of, they're dipping in both sides. There's right? a liability issue there. There, there could be a liability, but right. if they remain within their private membership, they, the liability, all of that is addressed within the PMA founding documents. Right. It has nothing to do with the public whatsoever. Right. So let me give you an example sure. again with the restaurateur. You're in a country club and you have a wedding. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people coming to the wedding are not members of the PMA, but they're guests of the PMA. So, so you, 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 you circumvent some of that liability because the member and their guest as part of your founding documents, that means you can have a wedding there. You will have non-PMA members, but they're guests of the association. So in, in essence, for that event, they are, they are part of the association. Well, well that could be one am way I, Am I correct? I mean, I you, 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 are, you are touching on a, an area that um, needs to be addressed within the founding documents. documents. Right. Now, the founding documents, in the same way that you have a business and, or, or an organization, um, a community organization, in the same way that you can modify those, you can modify your documents for the PMA. Right. All of that is addressed within the PMA. So so in your particular example, let me actually offer a little something else um, that's a real life example. Okay. Uh, at a recent uh, PMA meeting, introducing it to more businesses, there was a supplement manufacturer who was there. And the supplement manufacturer- Like vitamins and protein but, powder. Yes, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. a, a major customer of this supplement um, manufacturer is GNC. And the question was, does GNC have to be a member of my PMA? And the answer is yes, because you're a manufacturer of supplements, your customer or your member customers are your distribution um, network, and mm -hmm. that would include GNC, so GNC would, but GNC's customers don't, don't have, have to, to be, be members because GNC is your member uh, distribution, right. but its customers are not your end product. Exactly, and I get, I'm similar, similar to that is, because the next question was, what about my supply chain? Does my supply chain also have to be members of my PMA? And the answer is, no, they do not. Because what's important here is your founding documents detail what you're going to do, how you're going to serve your members, or what product you're going to create for your members. As long as that is what you are doing, that is all that has to be part of your PMA. Okay, and I'll come back to the country club restaurant. Mm -hmm. They get their food from a national chain, but the food they're serving their members is what we're concerned about. And they've transformed that food, and it's that transformation of food to their private members, members. that that okay. gives them Got their it. protection right. and gives the uh, uh, public no authority, no jurisdiction. Right. 
Oh, and, and, and I get it. I mean, you know, I'm sort of in my mind going through that when I've been to the such and such country club, when I've been to, you know, another private event, and, and you know, the way they cook their food, et cetera. So this is all starting, you know, I'm trying to sift the sand through the hourglass here because this is a, I think this is a very, very important subject because the rights and the um, liberties in Americans in two years have deteriorated mm -hmm. to, and, and people in America, they don't understand because unless you have relatives like I do who left Czechoslovakia in the 1920s, mm -hmm. or you happen to, to be uh, Jewish who have grandparents who were in a concentration camp, or who were in Poland, or who were, were in Bulgaria, who were in the Eastern Bloc countries where the amount of, of call it tyranny, uh, but oppression on them from government agencies was pretty hard. And I have a woman who works with, with my company who's from Soviet Russia, mm -hmm. and she, you know, she came here to Santa Barbara 20 years ago. Um, and she remembers as a child in the 70s, you know, she, you, she would see these things, and, and she, she understands. And, and a lot of people back east know their government lies to them, whereas here in America, we're getting you know, fed this, mm -hmm. this information from the Centers for Disease Control. And to me, people are sort of, you know, jumping on this stuff hook, line, and sinker, as opposed to actually looking at things. And I don't, I don't want to get into medical data or this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. I want to stay in the confines of the PMA. And, and part of is how does the PMA uh, get us out of this? So finish your thought. So, so what I would remark on there is one of the reasons why we Americans have been so trusting in our government is because our government, it's the only kind in the world, um, is, is by the people by the people, for the people. What has happened is that we as a nation have long ago um, lost the training that we need for self-governance. Mm -hmm. But we've trusted in the government, and that's a legacy thinking it's that, that we've had for a long time, because we are, make the assumption that um, the government, because it's us, is doing the right thing. Because most people want the same thing. Most people are good. And m human nature is you project yourself and your frame of reference onto others. Mm -hmm. So we good people in the United States, in America, we good people say you know, our government is good because we are good because our government is an extension of us. What we are coming up against is we've started to discover that while we were busy taking care of ourselves and our families, our governments and bad actors in our government, I don't care, it has nothing to do with party affiliation, but bad actors in our government have been busy consolidating a grip on the governing mechanisms. And what the PMA does is it helps restore the private supremacy that our country is based on, mm -hmm. private property, private individual responsibility. Private contracts. Private right. contracts. Mm -hmm. That is what our country was founded on and is what made us different than any other nation in the history of the world, is that that kind of penultimate, that ultimate privacy of right. person right. that directs us to understand that our inalienable rights come from God. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it flows down that the privacy to our person, our bodies, our children, our families, our homes, our private contracts, our private negotiations, that is what our country was predicated on when it, in its founding. That's what our founding documents illustrate and were developed to prevent the government from doing what the government is doing today. So the reason for right. PMAs and the reason for PMAs writ large in our country is that we need to continue to provide services to people, health services, medical services, food services, distribution services. We need to continue to live while we bring the governing bodies back to heal and become once again a government of the people, right. by the people, and for the people. And so we do that by really inhabiting the private realm of commerce, the private domain, and that takes us out of the jurisdiction of the public rules, regulations, agencies, mandates, executive right. Well, that's, what I, that's my next question, is yes. how can we not be a part of a COVID mandate? Is a PMA 
uh, subject to the jurisdiction of a COVID mandate. No, not at all. Even under emergency authorization. That is correct, it's not at all. The only way it could be potentially that way is if it were ever argued successfully in court that somehow the PMA was a danger to the public. That is the only way that they would then be able to claim some kind of jurisdiction over the PMA. Cocaine running, they, they get some- Precisely. It's like what's Walter from, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, television show where he's the chemistry teacher, I can't, Breaking Bad. Where oh, he, okay, He's got yes, the cocaine right. and the money in the back of his house. Right. So I, I can, yes, I can understand so that. It, so, so, but COVID mandates is, is, is something that is not really even law. It's just somebody says so. Exactly, exactly. So, and this is where I think a lot of people are still, especially here in California, because in one of our conversations, I said I traveled around the country in June, and most people in Texas and Iowa and Nebraska mm -hmm. and even in Michigan are really sort of over the whole masks and this other thing. But here in California, it's still being, you know, and that's why I, I, I'm, I'm so excited about this, this, this whole PMA mindset is that, you know, you can just say, I'm, you know, I, I'm, you have no jurisdiction here. This is not something that, that we as an organization or an association will, will either tolerate or whatever. So let me, let me, really, let me illustrate. Um, I hope this will help to clear up a couple of things. You talked about clubs, private membership clubs. Like a country club. So like right? a country club. Mm -hmm. Well, in Texas, for instance, there are lots of dry counties where you're not allowed the county uh, rules and regulations say you can't serve alcohol. The state says you can, but the county, the local government says you cannot. Okay. So you have a private club that serves alcohol. It's private, so it's able to serve alcohol. Your public restaurants in that county cannot. All right. Now, if a private member who is 16 years old goes into that private membership club and drinks alcohol, leaves that private membership club and gets into an accident in that dry county, the police, when they come to investigate, they discover, they say, where did you get the alcohol? This is a dry county. You can't get alcohol in this county. The 16-year-old says, well, I got it at the private membership club I'm a member of. Now you have broken the law because you're not allowed to serve minors alcohol. Therefore, anywhere, so there, it doesn't exactly. matter if you're in a right. Therefore, therefore, the jurisdictional protection you had in your private membership club is is gone. It's null and void because, because you right. broke the law because right. you cannot break the law. Now you take that same example, and now the person is 21. That person goes out and gets into an accident. The police investigate and the police said, where did you get the alcohol? This is a dry county. You're not allowed to drink and buy alcohol in this county. And the 21 year old says, I got it at my private membership club. The police go, oh, well, then you're under arrest for driving under the influence, but they have no jurisdiction and there is no retribution, blowback or anything against the private club okay. because they did not break the law. Mm -hmm. You did as the individual right. getting behind the mm -hmm. wheel of a car knowing you should not be driving. So the, the rules, bylaws and regulations of a private membership uh, association can only go so far in terms of criminal intent like you say, the, the person driving under the influence is, is a criminal intent, no matter the 16 year old, no matter if it's a dry county or not, that's just against the law. Correct. But then it begs the question, why is it against, because she's out of the jurisdiction now of the PMA? Because this is a jurisdictional thing. Once she leaves the private membership club, she's not under the jurisdiction. And is she 16 or 21? 16. So at 16, once she leaves the PMA, she, the PMA should never have served her anyway. Right. So now that she has left and is stopped for drunk driving, the police, when they discover that she got the alcohol in the private domain, now they can they pierce can the private they domain can because that. the law was broken. Right. But when they investigate that same situation with a 21-year-old, the law has not been broken. Right. You're allowed to serve a 21-year-old liquor. And it's the individual, the responsibility of the individual who broke the law, not the PMA. Right. And that's the, that's the big distinction okay. and, in that and regard. So, so when we sort of look at criminal intent or criminal negligence well, or criminal anything, that pierces, that pierces the, 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 well, the application it, it, of the PMA. We have to be careful about the choice of words because criminal intent is something else no, again. Criminal, like criminal, I say, the, the driving under the influence as a 16-year-old is a criminal offense. 
It's a criminal offense, right. and if you aided and abetted that criminal offense by serving alcohol to an underage minor, right. then yes, you can, you have liability. Right. Okay. So but I, if, instead of intent, I'm going to say liability. So right, right. you have liability okay. there. But if it's a 21 year old, you don't have liability because you're a private entity that can serve alcohol because you're private only to your members. You okay. serve only to your members. And the individual, when they left that, when they left as a private member, as a private member, they got into their car, they carry with them personal individual responsibility right. as a 21-year-old for turning on their car and driving under the influence. Right. Well, I, I think that this is an interesting concept because of the word personal responsibility. And one of the things that I'm seeing in America right now is grown adults who are not taking the responsibility for raising their children, just let the doctors do all this stuff, vaccinate them, mask them, or whatever it's gonna be, um, their own personal responsibility. And, and, and I actually see a PMA as, as basically, if you're gonna structure bylaws, you're gonna to have to conform to these as an adult. There's just certain things about a private membership. It's, and, and, and I'm gonna to continue to go back to that country club because by God, if you ever do anything against that country club, you're out of there. You know, they have specific rules and regulations. And some of these country clubs, and my, um, my w w wife's parents uh, were members of, of a country club uh, in, in, in the Detroit area for 60 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, since, since the late 50s, they were members of this country club. Now, they're both passed away right now, but it was interesting to go in there and to see, like, you know, part of this thing is, is this, you, they're just, you have to wear a sports coat, you have to have a dress code, you have to do certain types of things while you're there. Um, there are certain rooms that only men can still go into, which I find very interesting. So they have the, their own rules. It's like, well, wait a minute, as a woman, I got it wherever I want. Well, not here you can. And so, that's true. And you abided by that when you joined the association. Correct. Now, there can be, and, and where <laughs> it, um, some of the piercing of private clubs occurred is after the United States passed laws against discrimination right. for race. Right. And so you cannot discriminate on race, sex, creed, religion, those kinds of things, because that's against the law. So now in a private organization, right. a private, a PMA, if you say, I'm only going to make my private members all have to have blue eyes, or my private members all have to have brown eyes, if that is your criteria, you if somebody makes a successful um, lawsuit for discriminating against everybody that doesn't have brown eyes, they have to take it to court, right. and you would have to appear in court. And if they, if the judges then d decided that yes, you are discriminating for eye color, mm -hmm. then you have a, you, 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 you right. have now broken the law. Or in the case of a of a country club here in Southern California, that discriminated based on the color of the skin, <laughs> exactly, and and, yeah. and and got away with it until maybe twenty years ago, and, and b just because. You know, there were a couple of things that you couldn't be to join this club. I found it very interesting because I said, well, this is 1998 or whatever, and they're still doing this. And they're like, well, they're, theoretically, they're still breaking the law, but, but it, was, it was so entrenched. Anyway, so, um, so there's going to be a next round of mandates. One of the things that I, I see with this whole mindset here in California with the mandates is that the data say one thing. The scientific uh, situation says one thing, but the political winds are blowing in another direction and one of the things is you know you know mandating vaccines to children five years old which there's absolutely no scientific data that that would elucidate that a child at five years old is is going to catch covid is going to spread covid is going to have any any medical aspects about covid but yet they want them to get vaccinated now i have my own theory about why uh public health officials are doing this but that's not germane to our segment today but if they're lulling people into complacency and then they're going to make a bigger push to laws and mandates, how does a PMA sort of get us out of that? Now, you've answered part of it, but, but you know, like a family, can, 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 can a group of parents from an elementary school be a PMA? Yes. Okay. 100%. And can they send their kids to the public school and say that you're not vaccinating them? Or is that a different thing? No, they have to send them that, to a private school. It has to be, so they PMA can be, school. correct. Okay. Correct. You can't, you can't have it both ways. And something that's really important to understand that I've gotten uh, that's confused a lot of people, business people especially, is that this is not about avoiding anything. This is not about circumventing the law. This is not about paying, not paying your taxes. 
taxes or anything of the sort. This is about operating within the private domain based on the contractual agreements that are instituted or constituted by virtue of your founding documents in the PMA. And because it is private, the public rules, regulations, agencies, and so forth do not have jurisdiction over the private enterprise any more than they have jurisdiction over your private home. Right. And I or think what that's, you do right. in your private home, as long <laughs> as what you are doing is lawful. Now, another example, if, you're, if a neighbor called because they said, uh, they said to the police, I hear that um, it sounds like somebody's being murdered next door, and the police come and knock on your door, and they open the door, they can't just come into your home. That's private. Right. They come to the door, they say, we got a call from a neighbor saying that some, they sounds like somebody's being hurt here. Is anybody being hurt here? And the individual says, no, no, I just had the TV up loud, right? The police can't then say, I'm coming in to just make sure that you told me the truth. Even They're not they, allowed even to do they, that. Well, even though they try that on, on a regular they, basis. They, so. they, they, might, they right. might try that, but, but the reality is if they did, they could go to court, you could go to court and prove that they're not allowed to. They're, uh, they're, hundreds and hundreds of court cases that sustain your privacy to your home. Now, right. in that same situation, if while, somebody, while you're standing there talking to the police, somebody comes up behind you and, you, they, and the police see that that individual has a black eye, a bloodied nose. Um, and, now they've got reasonable suspicion. And, and, the, police, and the police say, um, excuse me, but are, have, you, have you been injured? Did this person assault you? If that person says, no, I fell down the steps, the police again have no authority right. to come in. Right. But if that individual says, yes, that person standing there assaulted me, now the police have a reasonable, has a, have a reasonable um, suspicion, suspicion to, right, to get, mm -hmm. to, that you've broken right. a law right. because you're not allowed to assault another person right. and therefore can provisionally take you into custody based on that. Right. And then the rest of it will play itself mm -hmm. out. But up until that moment, they could not okay. because they're not allowed to right. pierce the privacy of your home any more than they're right. allowed and, to and pierce really, the privacy of your PMA. I, I, I'm going to move on to a couple other questions sure. here, but I really want to sort of reiterate here that we're about a little more than halfway done with, with the interview is that we're talking about privacy. We're talking about mm -hmm. Fourth Amendment. And you can, you can say that the Fourth Amendment says this, but in, in a world of high technology right now, this is one of the things that um, um, Catherine Austin uh, Fitz says. Mm -hmm. She's a, the leading economist. She was in the Bush administration. She says, because of the high technology world we live in, our phones are, are the you know cameras everywhere listening devices you know what you Siri all these kind of things they're spying on you all the time you you are you may not understand that you are willfully giving up your Fourth Amendment rights but as you get into a private membership organization or association that PMA actually guarantees those rights for you as long as you abide by the the as long as you're not breaking the law. As long as you're not and, breaking the and, rules and regulations of the PMA. Correct, right. correct, uh, correct. So, so an example to stay with that, to stay with that, um, if you were in a, a medical PMA and, there, and you were seeing a medical professional, MD, and the MD, now in California, you can't give a prescription unless you're a licensed MD, right? So now in that particular situation, this doctor, this MD, is licensed, but that MD is seeing a patient and is doing everything for that patient, consulting them with them on their health, describing this, that, and the other, making recommendations about how they might address their health and so forth. If there are some hidden camera that is there and somebody takes a picture and this in this private member setting, the MD says, now I'll give you a prescription, that could possibly pierce the privacy piece of it. But now if that MD there says to you, so I need you to come by my office next week, uh, wherever that office is, come by my office and we'll get you set up with the additional paperwork that you're gonna need. Well now you as the private member of that PMA, PMHA, Private Member Health Association, mm -hmm. you have gotten your consultation with that doctor for your health, you go away with information about how you're gonna treat that condition, whatever that condition is, right. You go home and you say, you know, I'm feeling so much better. I'm not going to go to the doctor's office and get a prescription because I don't think I need it. Okay. Or you say, you know, I'm really glad that I've got that appointment at the doctor's office to go get that prescription for whatever because I really think that will help clear this up. Mm -hmm. Now you go to the licensed MD's doctor's offices 
which is licensed by the state. And now that doctor, that same doctor who saw you in the PMHA, that same doctor now issues you a, license, a prescription within the confines of the public domain. Okay. And now you take that prescription and you get it filled. Okay, so one more question about mm -hmm. this, the, the medical aspect. In a PMA, I am a naturopath mm -hmm. or I'm a chiropractor and I have a, a device or I have a treatment modality or I have a diagnostic criteria that a person comes to me and let's just say that I, in, in my private membership uh, association, I have a practice that uses um, um, the amp coil, which is, mm -hmm. which is a, a elect electromagnetic frequency, sort of like the Royal Rife treatment, and I say I can cure cancer. Who's coming after me? You can, only, you can do that in your PMA if you are dealing only with your private members. Okay. Nobody is coming after you. In fact, one of the things that um, sometimes helps people to understand better what we're talking about is if you wanted to get a list of businesses in California, you can go to the Secretary of State's office and get a list of LLCs, for instance, right. or S-Corps. Right. You cannot, there's no clearinghouse for private membership associations because they are not required by virtue of their bylaws and articles of association. They don't have to register anywhere. So there is no place for you to go and get a comprehensive listing of PMAs. Okay. So the medical community, so first of all, medical licensing in the United States did not begin until after the Civil War. Prior to the Civil War, um, when we were still largely an agrarian um, uh, country, prior to the Civil War, if you wanted to put a shingle out and said, I'm, I'm a doctor, you could do that. And if you treated people and they got well and they really liked you and word of mouth gave you the business and you got lots of business and you treated generations, you were a doctor. Mm -hmm. You were a doctor. It was only after the Civil War when there were large concentrations of culturally different public people coming together in urban areas right. that gave rise to certain rules, regulations, agencies like the American Medical Association right. or and, the state boards. Right, and that, a lot of that happened right at the turn of the century with the Flexner Report and the Rockefeller Correct. Foundation. Correct. Same, so, same thing is true right. of attorneys, mm -hmm. same thing mm -hmm. is true of, in, in some ways of marriage licenses. So all the licensing really began in earnest in this country after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. In the 1870s is really where it started to accelerate and then it really you know, came to the fore over the next two generations right. or 50 right. years. Okay, so next question. What is the difference between a PMA and a, and a, and a private education association, a PEA? They're one and the same. Um, the PMA, uh, people are referring to them to PEAs now because that describes, it's more descriptive of the type of private association that it is. So under is, is a PEA or a, maybe a private medical association or a private sports association or Correct. a private country club association all part of the PMA moniker? It, it, yes, it's all, it's all part of, it's not even a subset of the PMA. PMA is actually the descriptive um, words for the kind of constitution or the kind of collection of individuals who have agreed as members to have a certain set of rules and regulations that they will abide by within their membership. Right, so it could be, it could be a PEA or any other type PEA, of sports P -P program or something like PSA, right okay. PSA. Uh, yeah. Okay. The the key here Cross is specific no, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> the key here really is um, private members uh, associations serving private, private members. People. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Now I want to talk a little bit about now, and, and I've been watching. Uh, you know, you and I have spoken on the phone. I'm really trying to, to dive into this thing, and I, and I and I was watching the Freedom Angels do a an interview, a series of interviews with a man named uh, David Edwards, who mm -hmm. seems to be one of the authorities on PMAs uh, on the internet, especially on YouTube. And he got to talking about tax filings and bank accounts and unincorporated businesses, 508s and all these kind of things. And I have been very much interested in the tax structure in the United States for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, before I went and worked for a quasi-government agency for 17 years, um, I was really interested in why certain people don't pay income tax. And uh, he actually got into this and he said that in a PMA structure, and I want to read this exactly, he says, if you do your initial documentation and you do it, which, which, which would not sort of be tax filings. So in other words, you sort of put those to the side. You have no tax liability, so therefore you have no need for an accountant. 
It's different than a bookkeeper who just keeps tracks mm -hmm. of, of these private transactions, but you don't need to have an accounting firm because the accounting firm is really your, your, your inroads to the IRS. And he says, you don't really need that if, if the transactions that you're doing within the private association are private. And I'm, I, I would take this, I'm gonna be really simple here, uh, Deborah, that my son wants to cut the grass. Son, you cut the grass, you get $5 every week. Okay, that's between me and my son. I'm not paying, he's not gonna pay tax on that because he's just not, he's nine years old. Mm -hmm. that's, my son's older, but, but I'm just saying that, that but, but you know, over the millennium, dads have been paying their sons or their daughters, you know, a certain amount of money to cut the grass every week and it's a private enterprise. There's no tax, I mean, the IRS would love to tax them on it. I mean, tax everybody on anything. Let's take it out of the family for a moment and let's think about <laughs> the kinds of um, private contractual obligations that most people are familiar with. Maybe you have somebody that cleans your house. Okay. Maybe somebody walks your dogs. Okay. Maybe somebody babysits your children. Okay. Those are all private transactions. Right. Now, if you have signed a contract with a babysitting service or with a dog walking service or something like that, uh -huh. excuse me one moment, okay. I'm surprised that I, I thought everything had been turned off on my phone, excuse me. But if you have that kind of um, uh, contract, then you have signed a contract with them, and that governs what you do in the exchange. But it's of a private contract. It's a private contract. But now, most of us don't have private contracts. Most of those, most of us, it's a uh, shake of the hand. It's a um, word of mouth. Right. It's a my word is my my honor kind of right. thing. Right, like the babysitter. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because I got now, if the babysitter makes a million dollars babysitting. It is incumbent upon that babysitter to um, handle that babysitter's tax uh, liabilities if that babysitter has any. It's not your responsibility. It's but, not yours. But, is, but, but I'm going to come back to the transaction in and of itself was under the, under the jurisdiction, per se, of the PMA. Why is it anyone else's business? Why is it the IRS's business that that woman made $5,000 a year or... $905,000 a year. So, so here's the thing. In our country, um, we collect taxes that should be used, not to say that they aren't. They're misused dreadfully, and we should not be paying nearly what we are. But taxes originally started as a function of being able to pay for those things that the public mutually uses, interstate highways, country roads, um, any infrastructure, bridges, so forth. That's what they're supposed to be used for, right? That kind of thing. They're not supposed to be used for all the other things that have been out there. So why do some people not pay taxes? Because they can afford to handle, to hire people that help them understand IRS code sufficiently so that they can not avoid paying taxes, but they can legally pay only what they are required to pay. So now in a PMA, it's not about avoiding taxes. It's a business entity. If your business entity is a church or a 501c, 508c1a, a religious connected um, PMA, then that has the same kind of preservation uh, and, ta and taxes that a 501c3 would, for instance. But if I'm running a business as a PMA, if that business is for profit, you are responsible for the tax liabilities of that for-profit entity, P, that PMA entity, in the same way you would be for an LLC. Now, if you make enough money to hire the kind of accountant or CPA that can help you pay only that amount of tax that you should be paying, and no more and no less, fine, that's fantastic. Right. But you don't become a PMA because you don't want to pay taxes. That is not the purpose of it, and I encourage people to get that out of their minds because this is not about breaking the laws, it's not about avoiding taxes, it's not about avoiding anything, it's about participating fully in the private life with other private individuals. Right, and, and I understand that. And, and I, I would think that, that we would, this would be, the, the whole taxation thing would be a, an entirely separate issue because one of the things that I've been able to glean about taxes is that there's a lot of things about taxes that 
people think that they have to pay mm -hmm. that that from a jurisdictional standpoint they do not but that I don't want I, that that's a, that's a that would be like the next hour thing right. we have so the last couple questions I have here is these because um, just th that at one of them was here is that you know the state taxes um, it seems that they're not under the jurisdiction if you're not under the jurisdiction why would there be even be need to file income taxes so if you're doing a business and I want to stay with a babysitter if you're a if you're a wealthy family and you're paying this woman six figures to babysit your family all over the world and I knew I knew personal trainers that would travel with people yeah. and they would literally make six figures working with these with these people because they would travel all over the world with them so staying with the babysitter if it, you know if she doesn't file taxes nobody knows that she's made any income okay so that's her personal thing and I understood what you just said I I hundred percent I understand that but under the domain of a PMA if I paid that young man five dollars to cut the grass is there a liability issue to the IRS the same as that babysitter who made two hundred and fifty thousand dollars so it depends on how you've got your your PMA structured so for instance in some PMAs you pay only 1099s right. and as a 1099 the tax liability is only is based on that individual you don't pay payroll taxes because that's exactly. not your responsibility exactly. so that's how some people sometimes get a little um, confused about it right. so when you say don't pay taxes it may be that you're no longer having to pay payroll taxes you're not pay, paying Social Security because it's not on the PMA Ex to do that exactly. because you now have okay. 1099 um, individuals right. m member 1099 right. individuals and that make that makes a lot of sense because yeah. again a nonprofit you know I, the, the, there was a years ago the the Health Club Association of America which is called URSA was really really upset because the the, the YMCA's and the JCC's and these other nonprofit entities were not paying their fair share of taxes and everyone's got this whole thing on television about well they're not paying their fair share and a friend of mine who worked in a hospital said yeah we're a nonprofit hospital and we don't pay property tax but we pay everything else and for them to say that we're not paying our fair share is 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 crazy and and he went on to sort of deconstruct what they're saying so part of part of what i'm seeing here with 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 the uh, the, the the pma and its affiliates the pea the private education association and the pha the private health association uh, which which again mr mr edwards talks about natural health programs natural law faith faith-based organizations mm -hmm. etc and that that when we're looking at this whole deconstruction of persons personal health right now under the whole vaccine mandate under the pha the private health association they don't have any jurisdiction to do that as well and i think that's a very powerful thing because a mandate is not law and really under our current structure people really don't have to obey this but the courts are now finding, you know, ruling for companies like Southwest Airlines that their pilots association, they all have to get vaccinated. I think that the judges right now are breaking the law. But if, if let me ask, so let me ask, if, if the pilots were in a private member organization, as well as being in a union, would the, would the, 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 the parent organization, Southwest Airlines, still have the same ruling? Could, they couldn't even take them to court, could they, if they were, P, if they were PMA? Well, Again, what that sounds like you're describing a little bit of like a PMA union for Southwest pilots. Not exactly. They're already in so, a union. So, so, so um, there is actually um, Freedom to Travel Alliance, which yes, has begun. I'm a member. Um, which is, <laughs> as am I, they don't yet have the planes. But here, um, if the pilots became a PMA and they got aircraft, and they made contracts with private individuals to land on their private property. Mm -hmm. They would be able to do that. They would be able to fly, they would be able to take people because now they are not operating in the public. They did not ask permission. They did not get a license from anybody. Mm -hmm. they, they, the PMA itself has its own documents and how it's going to be resolved. They have private contracts with private individuals and, and entities for landing in private places. So they're not landing on airports that are made with public funds. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be subject to the public jurisdiction that paid for those public out of right. public and, funds and, and this is this is where I see this is and I want to kind of stay this is the yeah. last thing because we've just got about four minutes here we got about one more question is the, 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 the pilot thing is very interesting because under the laws of the Constitution Americans have the right to travel a lot of people when you get your driver's license say, oh no no driving is a privilege it's not a right 
And now what I know about the law, I would come back to that insurance agent when I was, as my 16 year old self and say, excuse me, Mr. Insurance Agent, traveling is a right, not a privilege. I can go wherever I want. And if I have a private automobile, I can take that private automobile wherever I want. Even though you say that the highways are public, the right to travel supersedes, because you're already paying property tax, okay? So, so it's like, I still have that right you know, and there's a lot of things that, that, that David was saying in his um, videos about if you're stopped by the police or the, that's, that's another, that's another mm -hmm. issue. But, but I really, the whole thing about the, pri the, the Freedom Travel Alliance and private airports and that, yeah, you probably can't fly a 747 into a private airport, but you can certainly fly a Gulfstream or a Citation or, uh, you know, or, or, you know, like these private, there's the private airline called JSX, which is Jet Suites, mm -hmm. and they fly now, and you can actually be, become a member of that organization. It's like a PMA, where you pay a certain membership fee to be in JSX, and then you pay for every leg that you travel on. Except that I suspect that they have been licensed in some state to be a business, and as a result, they would be subject to the jurisdiction of uh, those of state entities. Of, of those, yeah. yes, exactly. Okay, well, I, that might yeah. be. Yeah, you're and, right. And two, if they have taken federal money. So once again, if you take money from, uh, if, if the PMA, <laughs> if your health PMA, um, took money to from the federal government or the state government or the county government to build the facility, right. then you have now dipped into the public and your PMA is no longer strictly in the private realm. However, a PMA can contract with a public entity and that lease, uh, you know, that public entity's lease, as long as there was nothing in that lease that said, you as a PMA have to abide by everything that we ever say, right. then it's those governing documents, those contracts that govern mm -hmm. the relationships that go on and what happens. Right. Nothing okay. more and nothing less. Yeah. So, so you know, we, we touched about health. We touched on uh, things about uh, you know the, the structure of a PMA and education. We, and education, and then we we we, we, we ended up here with yeah restaurants. We ended up in in airfare because airfare is going to be air, airline travel is going to be I think the crux of this entire COVID mandate mm -hmm. is that they're going to try to stop people from flying on airplanes. And interestingly enough, at this time last year, there were about 500 to 1,000 airplanes parked on tarmacs on, in air, airports all over California because this is a hub. You know, the Boneyard mm -hmm. and all these other places are in California. There's lots of vacated places. So it's very interesting. So that's going to be another topic. I, I, I see some of these things. So in, in, our, in our last minute and a half, and boy, did this hour go fast. Mm -hmm. How do you fight City Hall within a jurisdiction? If you have, and I, and I want you to elaborate, properly written founding documents, bylaws for the organization, and then you go out and get your EIN business number, you are pretty much, you're, you're trying to, to get away from whatever the, the county, municipal, municipality, et cetera, jurisdictions in terms of finding, finding your business, right? Right, you're moving yourself um, outside of the public realm into the private realm of commerce, a private domain, and you can think of it as an extension of your home. Okay. And that, I think, is probably one of the most important features. And I think it's amazing. And, and, and I really, Deborah Baber, I, I really appreciate the hour. I mean, we, literally, we, we've just blown right through this. Where can people get a hold of you? What's the website? So I don't have a website, but there is a way that you can get more information. And I will share with you go ahead. PMA um, services websites that you can go to. You can send to info at the letter R values dot US. R values dot, dot US. US. Okay. Letter R values dot All right. US. Well, listen, and I'll be happy to give you several different uh, and PMAs anybody who that sees this will have some things, you know, in, in, in this as well. So I appreciate you being on this show. This is an amazing topic that's only going to become more of a uh, of, of an issue for people across the United States. So for our guest Deborah Baber, this is Eric Durack for uh, Forum TV Santa Barbara. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.